call on folks as, as they um, as questions are received. Um, and so with that, and without further ado, I will pass it over to David C. Harvey, the Executive Director of the National Coalition of STD Directors. David. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, before we start, I want to especially thank uh, the co-hosts for today's press conference, Dr. Tyler Tamir, the CEO of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, Zant Bryant, Sexual Health and Prevention Program Manager at the Washington State Department of Health, and the chair of the board of NCSD, and Torian Baskerville, who's the director of HIV and Health Equity at the Human Rights Campaign. Thank you all for joining us this morning. The status of the MPV outbreak continues to worsen. States and cities have declared public health emergencies in the last 24 hours. And last night, the White House announced two new MPV coordinators at the White House. This is welcome news. But where is the declaration of an MPV public health emergency by Secretary Becerra? We have 22,000 MPV cases in 72 countries. And in the United States alone, around 6,000 cases. And we know that is a vast undercount. It is hard to believe that just over a month ago, we had about 300 identified cases. This outbreak continues to grow out of control. And many of us warned that this would happen six weeks ago. Yesterday, the National Coalition of STD Directors convened STI and sexual health and HIV clinics from across the country to talk about and to present information to the administration on what was happening on the front lines. Program after program talked about the fear and stigma that gay men are experiencing uh, in relation to MPV, the shortages of vaccine, the burned out staff, the shortages of funding to cover what has been an unanticipated public health emergency. All programs spoke about how this feels like the early days of HIV and COVID. We must provide more money. We must reduce and eliminate barriers to testing care and vaccines, and the federal government must ease grant restrictions. We need new dedicated federal funding specifically for STI and sexual health clinics and HIV programs in order to deal with this emergency. The declaration of a federal public health emergency will help alleviate some of the problems we currently have but resources must follow. Congress must act quickly to approve the $21 billion pandemic preparedness ask, of which the White House indicates that as much as 7 billion may need to be devoted to MPV. Immediately, NCSD and those of us on today's call, our partners and other national organizations have called for a very, very modest immediate allocation of $100 million to deal with the response, no matter where it comes from or what the vehicle is. That would be a down payment pending this larger approval of funding by Congress. States and localities really have been left to respond to many aspects of this outbreak on their own. And contrary, this is contrary to the comments made by Secretary Becerra last week, uh, when he seemed to appear to blame the states and the cities for not responding adequately. Mr. Secretary, we are feeling Americans today, and this is a public health failure that follows COVID and the various earliest days of HIV in this country. It is time for us to turn this situation around. Without further ado, 
Um, it's my honor and uh, privilege to turn the, the podium over to Dr. Tyler Tamir from the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Dr. Tamir. Thank you, David. <clears throat> uh, good morning. You know, it was 1982, 40 years ago this year when San Francisco AIDS Foundation was formed by the community in a moment of crisis, a moment in history where the federal public health response failed cisgender and transgender men, as well as non-binary folks within the same social and sexual networks in our country, causing unnecessary emotional, mental, and physical harm and the loss of a generation. Now, I don't think we should ever draw a direct correlation between this moment and the beginning of the HIV epidemic. The story of HIV and that fight for life has its own crucially important yet complicated and tragic memoir, the scars of which will always remain a stain on American history. However, what should be noted is that we are once again in a moment where a lack of urgency and an inadequate response has left our community filled with fear, unanswered questions, and valid outrage. A moment where we have been abandoned by inaction and our community, a resilient people, have had to once again rise up in support of one another, to educate each other, and to fight for access to the resources that they need and deserve. So how did we possibly arrive at this moment? The history of the US government action on HIV and AIDS offers important lessons concerning the limits and possibilities of US public health policy and healthcare delivery. The last few years have taught us valuable lessons on how to intentionally and equitably scale up testing, community awareness, vaccination, and coordinated harm reduction messaging that can help prevent the spread of disease. But here we are, months after ringing the first alarms to the federal government, weeks after warning that we had an imminent window to get ahead of the spread of MPV in San Francisco. And now we arrive at a public health state of emergency, first in the city, and now, as of yesterday afternoon, declared by state of California. This morning, our waiting list at San Francisco AIDS Foundation Sexual Health Clinic, known as Magnet, reached 10,000 people for those we have deemed eligible for MPV vaccination at our clinic alone and are desperately waiting for us to have enough vaccine on hand to get shots in arms. This is unacceptable and was completely preventable. What cannot be overstated is that MPV is causing extreme distress, fear, anxiety, and pain in our community. There will be unfortunate lasting consequences to our communities because of the federal government's slow response and inadequate investment of resources to address this outbreak. The pathway forward requires clarity, honesty, transparency, and financial investment in the federal response. We need more vaccines and we need them quickly. This will require a clearly defined process and transparency around a realistic timeline for distribution. We must ensure that lower barrier and accessible testing, treatment, and vaccines are made more readily available to all people who may be at increased risk for MPV. Our clinicians need easier access to MPV treatment so that people who are diagnosed with MPV can receive care quickly and efficiently. We need to lift up vaccine equity and ensure that communities that are disproportionately being impacted by MPV have access to the information and resources they need. We must also immediately engage in planning that goes beyond testing, treatment, and vaccine and addresses the impact MPV will have on mental health, housing stability, job protection, and beyond. And finally, I'd like to note that in these moments, journalism offers writers a platform that directly influence public opinion over issues of importance. The ability to make editorial choices offers journalists inherent privilege. Writers therefore choose how news is depicted and how, how they hold a platform with a widespread exposure that will directly influence public opinion. In this moment, we must continue to fight stigma by balancing the need for population-specific messaging with non-stigmatizing, sex-positive, harm-reduction-focused health communication and public health response strategies. We cannot do this alone. So my ask to you today is to continue to report on MPV 
and issues impacting LGBTQ plus people into the future that strikes a balance between reporting the news accurately while not unintentionally propagating harm. Thank you for your time. I'll hand it back to you, David. Dr. Chamir, thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Zant uh, Brian. Uh, Zant, please take the mic. Thank you, David. While I'm happy to be here with all of you today, um, I'm not really happy that I have to be here. Um, for far too long, the country's public health advocates have been calling for help, pointing to cracks in the nation's public health infrastructure that could give way if the perfect epidemiological storm occurred. And over the past three years, we've been weathering that storm. Uh, as a sexual health program manager at the Washington State Department of Health, I can tell you that the past few years have tested our ability to meet this moment and to respond to the, not only the out of control STI epidemic, but also COVID-19 and now the monkeypox virus or MPV. On the ground, we've seen firsthand these past few years that staff of public health programs, including STI, HIV, and other programs have been stretched beyond capacity in our work to protect the public health. Um, when COVID-19 exploded across the nation, it was an all hands on deck moment for the healthcare system and public health programs, and everyone pitched in. Um, we had to take our eyes off, unfortunately, what until COVID-19 were the most numerously reported infections across the country, which is sexually transmitted infections or STIs. Unfortunately, that means that now a few years in, public health programs and STI clinics are overmatched because of the sharp increase in the numbers of people diagnosed with STIs like syphilis and gonorrhea. The results are clear and disturbing. Uh, for example, we have more people diagnosed with syphilis and more babies born with and dying of syphilis than we've had in decades. Now with the emergence of MPV, we're seeing the system under even further strain. Due to the labor intensive process that's part of diagnosing a patient for MPV, many state and local public health programs just don't have sufficient staffing to respond to the needs of community members with MPV and to people diagnosed with or at risk of STIs and HIV alongside. As an example, our largest STI clinic in Seattle is now primarily a monkeypox clinic. That makes it difficult for the clinic to perform the critical functions it does for its community that prevent congenital syphilis and help people, for example, get on pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV infections. No health department in the country has enough vaccines for those who need them, and the availability of treatment is likewise very limited. So while medical providers can now test and send samples to commercial labs, clinics that serve people whose insurance won't cover the testing can't take advantage of that broad in testing at commercial labs because of the cost associated with the test. I can tell you, as public health professionals, we understand how to respond to this outbreak. We've done the best we can with the information and resources we have, but more is needed from the administration, both when it comes to funding and guidance for the field. This problem shouldn't be a shock to anyone. Um, the public health system has been calling for solutions to this problem for years, and the STI field in particular has been active in sounding the alarm for the administration to allocate emergency funding to health clinics around the country and for the field as a whole. As a board member of the National Coalition of STD Directors, I, can t I, I know that state and local programs in Washington state are not alone in these challenges. Public health programs across the country are in the same boat we are. In the survey released today, we're seeing that STI clinics around the country are facing this same issue. The time for a wait and see approach has passed. We need a strong response and we need it now. On behalf of local, tribal, state and territorial health departments across the country, I urge the administration take swift action and allocate the funding necessary to support the anemic uh, STI field. To sustain our work, properly resource our current and future workforce, support the health of our communities and combat today's crisis, we need enhanced funding now. Increasing and sustaining funding to programs will ensure that when the next outbreak strikes, we're prepared and we have a strong foundation for this nation's public health response. Public health and community health programs need a steady stream of funding allocated through the appropriations process. David, go ahead. Thank you so much, Zant. Uh, and our last speaker, uh, but not least speaker this morning in today's press conference is Torian Baskerville from the Human Rights Campaign. Torian, thank you for joining us. The mic is yours. Thank you, David. 
We're in the midst of a public health emergency that requires the full and immediate action of federal, state, and local governments. Having just received news of the White House's appointment of Robert Feeden and Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, we're hopeful that they will help to ramp up mobilization of an all of government response to this public health emergency. However, the frustrations and concerns of gay and bisexual men and transgender men and women who are at this moment most impacted by MPV are very real and clear. In certain places, state government officials and elected leaders are not adequately addressing the MPV crisis. They're and it's unacceptable. I talked with someone the other day who was exhibiting symptoms and was turned away from testing or treatment at the health department because there were no more appointments, even though they did everything right, even arrived within the provided time frame. Another individual may face eviction because they struggle to pay rent after being denied paid medical leave three times, but have not been able to work due to being isolated to deal with MPV for 25 days and recently had their quarantine extended for five additional days because they are still exhibiting symptoms. These experiences are those of black and brown LGBTQIA plus identified individuals located in highly impacted areas like Georgia, DC, New York, and Pennsylvania. And it doesn't stop there. We've heard stories of people having to lie about their number of recent sex partners because some state and local health departments are not giving vaccines to those with fewer than three sex partners. Many have had their second doses postponed because of vaccine shortages. The reality of system glitches and failures, health departments turning people away, care providers that don't have proper information to administer guidance or treatment have led folks in our community to do what we've always had to do, care for each other and educate one another. The fact that our community had to step up to create a nationwide vaccine information list in Google Docs so that people can know where, when, and how to access a vaccination in their area is a clear example of how our system is not set up to respond to these emergencies effectively, especially when it affects vulnerable and often marginalized population. I want to make clear that viruses do not discriminate. There is no such thing as a gay disease and that the monkeypox virus is not a sexually transmitted infection. Homophobia and sex shaming should never be tolerated. It stands in the way of people accessing the care they need and prevents others from being aware of their risk. While it's true that anyone can contract this virus, especially through close skin-to-skin -skin contact, there is also no doubt that there is an immense impact at this moment on gay, bisexual, and transgender men and transgender women. This is why we must have both a robust public education campaign on monkeypox while also prioritizing resources and critical information to groups most at risk right now. What we're hearing from our community, from sexual health clinics, from care providers on the ground, is that they do not have the necessary resources, supplies, and funding to properly treat and care for their patients concerned about MPV. While we've seen an increase in vaccine doses becoming available, we still need more. We also need more funding to respond to this public health crisis. That funding is needed to go to local health departments in both rural and urban areas to fund and partner with community sexual health clinics who are overwhelmed right now. To fund and partner with local LGBTQIA plus organizations who can better reach our community with information and to prioritize reaching black and brown communities and those without ready access to the tools needed to navigate a confusing and ill prepared public health system. In communities across the country, we're seeing a system that is responding best for people who have the resources and time to seek accurate information, testing, vaccines, and treatment. Every time there's a public health emergency, we see lower income and BIPOC LGBTQIA plus people being sidelined, unable to receive care and treatment in a timely manner. But it's not too late for change. Beginning today, we need more vaccine doses.
distributed quickly and equitably, prioritizing outreach to vulnerable populations. We need health departments to be transparent about their distribution process from eligibility requirements to getting both doses in arms. Although testing capacity is up, access to testing remains an issue. We need more access to testing and quicker results so that public health officials can get out in the community and meet people where they are. We need more funding for sexual health clinics and community health organizations so they can be properly staffed and supplied to meet the demand for testing and vaccinations. And we need more direct care provider education and training to combat stigma and to provide accurate information and care to their patients. Our community is suffering from a virus that should, not, that should have been contained weeks ago. The best time to act would have been then. The next best time to act is right now. Thank you. Back to you, David. Thank you very much, Dr. Tamir uh, Zant Torian. Uh, your comments were really moving, and we really appreciate you sharing uh, your frontline expertise on what's going on at the moment across the country. I'm going to turn the question and answer period of this uh, press briefing over to Stephanie Reichen, who will lead um, this next portion. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, We'll begin questions. Uh, Chris Welch from Fox 5 in New York. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Hey, so I'm a reporter in New York City, but my question is not just New York City. Specific. It seems that there's been a lot of attention in recent weeks focused on testing and prevention and vaccines, and rightfully so, but it seems that there's and very few people, even among those who've contracted monkeypox, seem to know that there's FDA approved treatment out there in the form of T-pox. And specifically when it comes to guidance on how to get this treatment, there seems to be none on federal, state, or local city websites. So I guess my question is, you know, I've, I've connected with people in the LGBTQ community who have had to take it upon themselves to tell each other and help educate each other on how to get this treatment can and should public health officials do more to not only help get the word out but help people actually get this treatment and what can they do? Great. Ty, Dr. Tamir, would you? Sure. Um, you know, I first let me say that the, you know, the current um, CDC protocol for TPOX requires that clinicians that want access need to go through this extraordinarily complex and restrictive ordering process to obtain it directly from the CDC. Once you've obtained that approval, then um, the individual clinic or clinician has a stack of paperwork that is taking sometimes two to three hours per patient um, to be able to complete. And it has overburdened many clinics to the point where uh, some clinics have decided that they are unable to integrate TPOX treatment into their day-to-day -day operations. This is part of the reason that states um, and cities right now who have disproportionate impact of monkeypox have been calling for public health um, of, of emergency in their cities to get additional workforce, either from local public health or the state level, to help on-site more hands-on deck. Um, at our clinic in the Castro uh, here in San Francisco, we have just um, now gotten uh, our workflow together to be able to begin offering treatment, although we've been getting calls about it for weeks. We're dealing with a workforce of clinicians, I think, that are coming off of um, a really rough few years. Our, our clinics are understaffed, um, and this is why, more than ever, we need more resources in our community um, more people power to get treatment into the hands of those who need it the most. I 100% hear you though. We run a monkeypox hotline at San Francisco AIDS Foundation. We receive hundreds of phone calls a day and dozens of those are people who are advocating for themselves to access treatment. We're doing our best to refer folks um, and soon we'll be able to offer it um, ourselves in-house in a limited way. And Chris Welch, I'll, ju I'll just add, in, in terms of federal policy, it's unconscionable not to further make changes to make TPOX accessible to all that need it. We know this is an investigational drug, uh, but the federal government has options for how it can make this drug available 
on an expedited emergency basis. This is one reason why we're all calling for Secretary Becerra to, de to excuse me, to declare a public health emergency. Um, we want and stand by the need to safeguard patients and the treatments they're receiving. But all indications are anecdotally from across the country that TPOX is safe and effective. We have to make this drug more available. Thank you both. And thank you, Chris. Um, I'd like to ask Ariel Dreher. Um, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your last name, Ariel. You should be allowed to unmute now. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I have one follow-up question on TPOX, if you don't mind, and then a separate question. Uh, we've heard from the federal government that they have made that process quicker in terms of paperwork for TPOX, but it sounds like that has been slow to roll out. So I just wanted to confirm if that is coming, if there is a streamlined process down the road that clinics can use, or if that is not an option. And then my second question is, um, could a few of the clinic pro providers give me a description of how vaccine distribution is working? I'm not sure if this is different state to state, uh, but if you have a wait list of 10,000 patients, I'm guessing that uh, there are some streamlined issues. Thank you so much. Um, to clarify on TPOX, from my understanding, um, what was a very laborious um, page intensive application has been streamlined to a degree, but we're talking, you know, 20 plus pages down to 10 to 12 pages of paperwork. So it's still taking quite a bit of time with each patient um, to get them into the process. Although it has been streamlined enough that our clinic has gone from feeling like we couldn't have the capacity to offer TPOX to now signing the paperwork and um, being able to provide in the days ahead for those who need it. Distribution of vaccine here in California um, comes from the Federal <clears throat> Reserve to the state of California, who makes a determination on the allocation across the state, with the exception of Los Angeles, who receives their vaccine directly from the federal government. Um, in California, up until recently, the allocation has been determined on size of metropolitan area, number of confirmed monkeypox cases and early detection of syphilis in your city. And um, that then goes to the local public health department who determines their strategy for mass vaccination and community-based clinics to reach priority communities. Here in San Francisco, we have seen the majority of vaccine allocation go directly to our mass vaccination sites, so San Francisco General Hospital, um, where folks are waiting um, for hours in hours in line for their walk-in clinic, um, some standing for six to nine hours to receive their appointment, even though um, they have been there sometimes since four or five o'clock in the morning, where community-based clinics receive much smaller allocations for their general operations or to do proposed pop-up clinics for priority communities such as the Latinx community, which has been disproportionately impacted by MPV and our community. And then finally, um, as we're looking at the overall need here in San Francisco, it's been a couple of weeks now, about two weeks since the leadership at San Francisco Department of Health requested 35,000 doses of vaccine um, for San Francisco to try and beat the curve. That request was met with about 4,000 doses. We, to date in San Francisco, have only received a little more than 12,000 doses for the entire city of San Francisco. And our clinic alone, um, which has the waiting list of 10,000 individuals, has only received a little more than 1,000 doses to address the wait list. Great. Or Torian. I just wanted to make sure, Zan or Torian, did you want to uh, add anything? And then I'll, I, I have one final comment. I think I, what I would say is that uh, what uh, Dr. Tremere describes is not uh, unlike what's happened probably all over the nation uh, that we've heard from STI clinics and programs. 
the states do receive vaccine from the strategic national stockpile uh, and then allocate that, you know, with the very small amount that we have received up to this point, it's been heavily focused on vaccinating people who were contacts because we can use the vaccine to prevent people from developing disease. Um, so it's been allocated based on places where we have lots of cases, the, the most cases of monkeypox virus actually diagnosed. That would change significantly. And there are lots and lots of community members who are out there waiting uh, to get vaccine. Uh, and I would say as border state, a Northern border state, I will also point out that um, the community is so animated around this that many of them have gone North to Canada to get, to get vaccinated. And we're grateful to our neighbors for sharing that service with us. Um, but that shouldn't have been necessary. And that also leads to problems in equity because not everybody has the time and resources uh, to travel to a jurisdiction next door to get vaccinated. And I just wanna add and clarify because uh, for members of the press on the call today, because I've been asked this question a lot. Um, state, cities, local health departments are making very tough decisions around rationing access to vaccines because there is not enough. And this is causing problems with equity and reaching those who most need it. Torian uh, spoke very eloquently to these issues. The other thing that I wanted to add, uh, because I've been asked this a lot as well, is that what you're hearing from today are health department experts, policy experts, and of course the front lines. Uh, local community based organizations like the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, like the STD clinic um, run by the city of San Francisco are trusted local providers of services. Private doctors, emergency rooms, other aspects of the healthcare system are referring patients to these organizations for good reason, because they're trusted providers and they are providers who have the expertise to treat MPV and other sexually transmitted infections. We anticipate that's going to continue to be the case as we go forward, but we do need the broader healthcare system to get up to speed and to respond as well. Stephanie. Thank you all. <clears throat> we have a few more questions and in order to get to everyone, if I could ask um, for, for reporters to ask one question, um, just so we can make it through to everybody. Um, Laura Brash um, from the News and Observer is up. Laura, you should be able to unmute now. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, this is a question that, you know, we've been getting a lot um, in the newsroom, um, within our newsroom, and then also just, um, you know, I've gotten a few emails from folks um, asking why, I mean, I know the answer because I'm in these circles, I'm a queer reporter, so I am in these circles, but, um, you know, people are asking about why transgender people are also being, you know, looped into the uh, groups that are most at risk, um, you know, because this conversation about men who have sex with men, well, then why are transgender people also sometimes being included in non-binary people? Um, you know, so just one that would love to hear some clarification on the language and, you know, the, the, the stigma there as well. And just in general, like um, what, you know, decisions uh, played a role in um, transgender folk um, being included in, you know, the, the messaging and the, the, the demographic that's being um, designated most at risk. So I'm happy to jump in from the perspective of talking about, for example, vaccine distribution or that type of thing. Even though the vast majority of cases have been diagnosed in people born male um, who identify as cisgender men, we recognize that people who are trans, regardless of sex at birth, who, who don't fit in the gender non-binary, um, are also members of the same community and have intimate contact with people who identify as gay and bi men. You know, there are trans men who are gay. Uh, there are non-binary people who have uh, sex partners or, or romantic partners who are uh, identify as men who have sex with men. So understanding, even though we don't think of monkeypox virus as an STI, understanding the broader sense of the community and how folks are connected is what leads us to include trans folks and uh, people outside the gender binary uh, in our messaging and in our vaccine distribution plans. Dr. Tamir Torian, anything else you want to add? 
Yeah, I would just echo what Zant said, but I will also include that, you know, there is clear not an, an attempt to conflate the identities, right, of, of trans individuals um, when joining them into the conversation, right? We, we are very clear that they are not to be associated directly as an identity with uh, gay men, but that they are part of the community, as Zan said, that is often impacted because of co close uh, proximity to how they connect with Black, uh, with gay men. And so that's important distinction and messaging. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Appreciate it. Um, up next, we have Fennett from the Washington Post. Go ahead, Fennett. Hi, thanks very much for taking time. Um, so the World Health Organization has uh, called has called for men who have sex with men to limit their sexual partners. We're not really hearing that kind of messaging in the United States. Uh, uh, Zant, since you're in a public health uh, agency, I'd like to hear from you on why on why we're not seeing um, that kind of uh, messaging. And then uh, Torian, may, maybe you have some insights on the lessons that we've learned from HIV about uh, about taking a harm reduction approach uh, to this kind to this kind of um, infectious disease. So I really appreciate that you immediately mention a harm reduction approach because that really is what we're looking for. Um, you know, to the extent that any individual can affect the outcome of something so broad as this outbreak, sure, there's an effect there. If people choose to limit their partners, they certainly could. That's one way to do it. But that's also assuming that this is a sexually transmitted infection. This is spread through intimate contact that goes beyond sexuality. Even, you know, if people attend, for example, um, a club event or for example, a pride event like, ha like have happened across the summer where there are lots of folks dancing in close proximity, things like that. Monkeypox, also, monkeypox virus also spreads this way. Um, and so I think we're acknowledging that approaching it from a purely STI related standpoint doesn't really meet the challenge and is only really part of the issue. The reality is that for us to respond to outbreaks that move through society like this, we need a systemic response rather than an in, you know, individualizing the responsibility. And that systemic response needs to be functional and well-resourced and engaged with communities, as you point out. Um, so I really, I would lean into equipping gay and bi men with harm reduction approaches from a variety of different, um, different directions, as well as our trans brothers and sisters and our straight and cis folks. Um, and, of course, the most important thing that we want to get into folks is vaccines. So we want people to be able to take power over their own health, to support the health of those they care about. And, and at the end of the day, what that takes is resource. It takes people, it takes funding, it takes clinical resources. Um, leaning into individualizing the responsibility, uh, I think, is not where we're at. Great. Yeah, and I would just I would just add, if I can, that it's important that we do not take the approach of attempting to control people's bodies. Um, we are learning that lesson with Roe versus Wade, right? And so we need not to take the approach of telling people what they should and should not do with their bodies. Rather, our approach should be providing all of the necessary education, resources available, and access for individuals to make the best, most Cells and allowing us to be there to support them, regardless of what the outcome of those decisions would be. Right, that's the approach that we should be taking, and I think that that is a lesson that we learned from the HIV epidemic. Right, that when we decide to want to control individuals' bodies, that we end up in situations that exacerbate the 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 out the issue and not really take care of what the problem is. And so, I think when we need to take from a holistic approach, right, which is another lesson that we learn in HIV. Right, it's taking a holistic approach to how we are addressing the epidemic and the emergency and doing it not from a fear based approach, but from a holistic approach. Great. Thank you so much, Fennett. <clears throat> um, all right. And Craig Washington also had a question. Craig, if you'd like to go ahead. Sure, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my question was uh, essentially, how is it that we can best support 
uh, the efforts and the voices of gay and other queer men, transgender individuals, gender fluids who are MPV infected and are trying to educate their local communities. So um, Torian and, and other panelists have talked about the early days of HIV and much that we've learned uh, from those days, certainly the experiential wisdom of the first generation of those infected. And I know of two uh, courageous individuals who are doing that work. So how do we support them in terms of sharing that, that wisdom? Who would like to take this? Yeah, I think it's important to, um, to again, acknowledge their experience, right? I think that's the first um, and support them in the best way that they had, that they need. And so it's asking them, what is it that you need and how can we support you? What, did, what is it that you need from us? Because I think each of those individuals um, will have different needs and different challenges as they're navigating through this through this diagnosis. And so I think it's taking a, again, a equitable approach, right? Understanding that they both have separate needs um, and then figuring out what those needs are. And then also amplifying those voices, right? And so in, 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 my, in my talk, in my remarks, I talked about an experience that an individual had who is going through the diagnosis and dealing with that process, right? And so we have to amplify those voices um, and get them into the spaces like this where people can make decisions that help those individuals in their experience. I would just add that, um, you know, often in these moments of crisis, when we are all stretched thin in the public health space, our first inclination is to create um, community town halls where we can provide information and we have clinicians and public health experts who are talking at folks, providing them information, which is crucially important. But um, what we don't always do is create the safer spaces for folks to share their experiences and their stories to let them um, advocate for what it is that they need and want during this time and then to be responsive to what actions we within public health or community organizations can do to support those efforts. San Francisco AIDS Foundation has um, done both of those in the last few weeks. We created both a town hall um, that was very informative and allowed for Q&A both in English and Spanish, um, and then made those available for those who were not able to attend via download from our website. And then last evening held a very non-hierarchical meeting for the community, both those who are in fear and those who have experienced monkeypox to, to get a very brief update and answer questions, but really to hear from experiences, to hear about frustrations and to hear how they wanted their voices and their stories lifted up and to empower them on how to best move forward. We have learned so much about the power of um, humanizing an epidemic. We've learned so much about the power of people's faces and voices as a tool for advocacy over the last 40 plus years of the HIV epidemic. And that is an example that we could and should be using right now in this moment. And Craig Washington, I, I would just add um, in summary, fear, stigma, shame. Every one of us has talked about this. And, and you know, unfortunately today in the context of MPV, our communities are living through all of this yet again. Trauma is real. We know that one of the major ways to fight stigma and misunderstanding is to lift the voices of people themselves who are living with MPV, the diverse voices of people with MPV who come from all walks of life. Uh, we have to do more of that as we go forward with MPV response. There's been some very powerful examples on social media of people telling their personal stories. When you look at the number of hits that those posts have made, you know that people are starved for the real lived experience of others who are dealing with MPV. It is a core public health strategy that we have to uplift. The HIV community proved the effectiveness of doing this through community organizing, and we must now do more of that as we go forward. 
Thank you so much, Craig. Are there any other questions? Um, we're sort of reaching the end of our time, but I want to see if anybody else has a final question or two that they would like to ask. Um, I've also seen some hands go up and down. So if somebody accidentally put down their hand, now would be the time to put it back up if you have a question. Looks like Laura Brash okay. has another question, I think. Yep. Stephanie. Go ahead, Laura. Thank you. all um, So I know that a lot of the conversations that we're happening there we're having here today are focused on San Francisco, New York, you know, Washington State, um, bigger states. But I'm in the South. I'm in, in North Carolina, and obviously, um, I was working on some stories. I've been working on some stories about this specific topic, and I noticed that when I was looking for like you know community advocates or community voices, people, uh, even the local organizations, grassroots organizations who tend to be the active voices in um, you know, these situations, um, we know that the queer community is really comes together when it comes to, you know, um, advocating for each other. Um, haven't seen much of that yet here in North Carolina, and I know that the cases are low, but I would love to hear, you know, um, why y'all think, um, obviously, there, this is a more um, politically conservative state with a lot of anti-LGBT legislation and policy um, that happens, um, but still, um, would love to hear y'all's perspective on why you think that there hasn't been that much organization around um, monkeypox um, in North Carolina and other more rural and southern states. David, do you want to take that one? Or I can try. Um, Laura, I think I would answer that question in the following way. I think that we're, in the words of one of uh, our STI clinic directors yesterday, we are at the beginning of the beginning of dealing with this. And although we are two months in on this, there has been widespread confusion, misunderstanding, a lack of a coordinated federal response. I am not pointing the finger individually at this moment on very, at very hardworking White House staff, HHS staff, CDC staff. There are people who care deeply within our federal government about MPV response, and we thank them for their efforts. But overall, we are failing in our response, uh, and it means the system has to change. But I think that we will see states organize communities to respond as we go forward, as the word gets out. All of you members of the press who are with us today, we deeply appreciate you being here because you're telling this story in a way that no one else can. The federal government can issue guidelines, it can make funding decisions, but it is the, it is the media and it is local communities that will take it upon themselves to organize. So I predict that that situation is going to quickly change as more information and more resources flow to local communities. I might just add that we live in a world and a society that still very much stigmatizes and shames sexual conversation and contact that doesn't understand and accept, especially in more conservative parts of the country, identity um, or intersectionality. And even here in San Francisco, when we have moments where we want someone to use their voice or their face as a tool for advocacy or to get awareness out around an issue. It's, it's not as though we have um, dozens of people in line. It can be difficult because we're asking folks to be incredibly vulnerable as we humanize a crisis that's happening in our communities. And uh, in the Southern United States, we have a much bigger battle to fight. We've been fighting that fight in HIV for decades. Even those of us who live in places like California who believe in the HIV epidemic that we can get to zero new HIV infections, we know that we can't end HIV unless we end HIV in the South. Um, and that is just a huge battle ahead for all of us that we'll have to work on in a coordinated way. Uh, so I think in this moment of MPV, you're probably facing a very similar struggle of finding folks who for very valid reasons um, are unable or 
unwilling to share their particular story, but I promise you there are many and they are out there and you will find them if you keep looking. Excellent. Um, well, I think that was our last question of the day. Um, I, I do wanna thank uh, the members of um, this panel for, for taking the time today. And also wanna thank all the members of the press who joined today. Thank you so much and thank you for your work. If you do have any questions, you all have our email address. Um, ncsd at skdnick.com. Um, please reach out. We'd be happy to set up interviews with any of the panelists as appropriate. Um, thank you so much for, for the call and um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.